Good morning. It is a true honor and blessing to be with you all this morning. Um, As we were driving here, I was telling my own children who are between the ages of four and nine how I used to come here to this conference. Now, it wasn't here in Indiana. It used to be the Ohio Conference, as many of you remember in past years. Uh, But I remember sitting in those back rows along with all the other young people as well and enjoying uh, the times that we would come together. Although I will have to say, uh, we had one disappointment when we came here. I told my children that this is an Indian conference, Indian Brethren Fellowship, and my children were disappointed when they found out that there is no Indian food at the Indian conference. They were quite disappointed at that. In fact, for next year, we are suggesting that a dosha station be set up in the cafeteria. And we're thinking that will really add to the uh, community here for the conference. But other than that, we're looking forward to a great time, great time together. Uh, Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 4. As uh, my brother mentioned this morning, I'll be uh, taking uh, this passage originally, as many of you know, our brother Scott DeGroff was intended to come and speak. And because of his health concerns, wasn't able to uh, come and give this message. So the committee asked if I would be willing to, and I'm I'm happy to do that. Although, again, I was disappointed that I wasn't able to be uh, here under Scott's ministry, but also his fellowship. Uh, You may not know, but Scott and I are actually old friends. We went to Emmaus together as students back in the early 90s. In fact, Scott and I were roommates many, many years ago. And the thought of sharing uh, this ministry together was something that we were looking forward to. But the Lord obviously has other plans. So let me just say I I appreciate your prayers for Scott and Lynn and his family. This has been a really tough season for our brother Scott. And uh, I'm sure he and his family would appreciate your prayers during this time. But we're going to endeavor to go through this passage together, Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 17. And if you can, read with me together in God's holy word. This I therefore say and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer as the Gentiles do. In the futility of their minds, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Due to their hardness of heart, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as his truth is in Jesus to put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness therefore having put away falsehood let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor for we're members of one another Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear and not to grieve the Holy Spirit. For whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. I'm in a bit of a battle. The battle is with my daughters. Now, you may think it's an unfair battle because my daughters are only four and six years old, and you would think, of course I could beat them, but they've been beating me over the past few years. The battle is about sleep. You see, my children, I have four of them, uh, my sons, they sleep upstairs in our house, and they've gotten into a good rhythm. They go up to their beds, they stay there all night, and in the morning, then they come down. But my daughters, they sleep across the hall from my wife and I, and they... They're not quite convinced that their bed is the best bed to stay in at night. And in fact, during the course of the evenings, at times they will get up 
two or three in the morning, walk down that hallway and come into our bed, thinking that our bed is better, more comfortable, more, a better situation for them. And sure enough, in those early hours, I try to convince my daughters, no, your bed is better. Go back to your bed, stay in your bed, remain in your bed, don't come here, this is not where you wanna be. But interestingly enough, trying to argue with a four and six year old girl at three in the morning, it doesn't work very well. My daughters are convinced they have to be in our bed, but the reality is when they're in my bed with my wife and I, I don't get a lot of sleep. They may sleep well, but they kick and they slap and they roll over and I get this little bit of the bed then to myself. It's not a very happy thing for me. So I'm trying to convince them, don't come here, stay over there. In fact, so much so that my children have now realized when they come into our room, they don't even come to my side of the bed. They go over to mom's side of the bed. She's a little softer when it comes to this fight. She l happily has them come into the bed without any worry. But it is a fight. And these little girls are winning. And it's something that I've been trying to deal with because I'm trying to help them understand it's better if you stay in their room. It's better if you stay in your bed. This is good, but this is better. Well, sure enough, the Apostle Paul here is dealing with a much larger battle. But to be sure, he is dealing with a similar idea. He's trying to convince the Christians here in Ephesus, this life is better. Why would you want to go back to this? This is what God has for you. How is it that you should go back to this way of thinking and living? He's trying to convince them that to go back to this way is not a good way. That going forward is better. And sure enough, as we see in this passage, this, this is something that Paul has been building up here. Our brother talked about this last night where the outline of Ephesians is very interesting. And Paul does this a lot within his writings. He divides up his passages into a lot of theology, into a lot of doctrine. And particularly in Ephesians, he talks about this reconciliation to God and reconciliation to others. He talks about this incredible, glorious work of the gospel and how it's made us right with God and how it has now made us right with each other. But then he goes on to talk about how because of that reconciliation, we are now united with each other. He tries to give some practical applications of that doctrine, how we can maintain unity through diversity and how we have to live out our lives in morality, the, the moral life of the believer. He wants them to understand these deep, precious truths and doctrines but he wants them to understand they need to be lived out. I can convince my daughters, cognitively speaking, that their bed is more comfortable. I have to help them understand, but through experience as well, that their bed is better than mine. I just can't give them the information. They have to experience, they have to live it out themselves. Well, sure enough, that's what the Apostle Paul is doing in this passage. As he is trying to convince the Ephesians to live out their life, he wants to base it on truth so they can live out that truth. And in this section here, we have a, an interesting argument that Paul is trying to give. If you remember last night, if you were here with us, our brother was talking about this heavenly calling that we've been given to. Even this morning, as our brother was opening up, he talked about how all of these other encouragements are to walk in positive ways. But this passage, this passage is about what you should not do, how you should not walk. Specifically, the walk like the Gentiles, and we'll talk about what that means and how that looks. We'll talk about how then we are to put off that old walk, to, to renew our minds so we can put on a new identity, a new way of living for Christ. And finally, some instructions on how to live in community. The reality that we live with other people in our, in our biological family, but even more so in our spiritual family. And, how do we live those truths out? So sure enough, he starts in to this list. He talks about the walk of the Gentiles. 
Look what he says again in verse 17. This I therefore say and affirm to you in the Lord that you no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. He starts talking about these Gentiles. Now understand, when he says Gentiles, he means everyone except the Jewish community. It's a code word for Paul, as it were, to talk about everyone who is outside of the community of faith. In the Old Covenant, that community of faith was defined by Israel, a special covenant people that God chose for himself. And so when he talks about Gentiles, well, he's talking about us. He's talking about us that are outside of God's special plan and favor. And he starts describing these individuals. He starts giving characteristics that, to be honest, this is not stuff that you would put up on your Facebook profile. These are not positive attributes that you and I look at when we think about people. But nevertheless, he starts talking about them. He starts talking about some things regarding their mind. He says that these individuals are futile in their thinking. Now, mind you, this does not mean that they're stupid. This does not mean that they have no intelligence, but it means as it relates to their knowledge of God, their thinking is futile. They cannot think like God thinks. If you remember, if you've read through Ephesians chapter one, there's a phrase that Paul uses over and over again in that first chapter when he describes the the ministry of the father. He says, to the praise of his glory. And then he describes the ministry of the son and he says, to the praise of his glory. And then he describes the ministry of the Holy Spirit and he says, to the praise of his glory. Every single activity of the triune God is to the praise of his glory. And the reality of an unbeliever, a Gentile who doesn't know God, they can't think to the praise of God's glory. It just doesn't make sense for them. He talks about how these individuals are darkened, that they have a deep darkness that swallows up their understanding that they cannot comprehend the things of God. In fact, he calls them to be ignorant. This is not a great term for us, but it's true of us in regards to God. This knowledge that we have in this world is just that. It's just of this world. But apart from God, they're ignorant. They can't know God. I remember walking one time with a friend of mine trying to explain to him just the gospel in itself. And I remember we came across this tree and I said, look, look at this tree. Look how incredible this tree is. The roots are deep. The leaves are out. You can't tell me this tree is just an accident. You can't tell me that this tree just came out of nowhere. I was trying to convince him that there was a creator behind the creation. And all my friend could do was look at it and says, yeah, it's a nice tree, but it's just a tree. <laughs> I hope that you and I, we look at those trees and we think, behold the creation and the glory of God. But my friend who is outside of God's will, he looks at it and he just sees a tree. His mind isn't enraptured with the joy of the creator behind the tree. He's darkened. His thinking is futile. He's ignorant to God. But understand, it's not just his mind that is apart from God. His heart is apart from God, too. His very affections are not in line with the glory of God. He says that there is a hardness in his heart. This word that Paul uses of hardness refers to this idea of like marble or granite. I don't know if you've ever worked with those stones before, but you understand that these are some of the hardest stones that are out there. And Paul says how this heart of the Gentile is like stone. The Gentile's heart is not attracted by the things of God. The Gentile's heart is not moved by the things of God. The the Gentile's heart is hard to the things of God. He also says that it is callous, this medical term. And we know that when you develop a callous on a part of your body, you can't feel 
anything anymore. Paul is trying to say that these Gentiles, these individuals who are outside of the, the, the knowledge of God, it's just not that they have bad thinking, they have bad feeling. They can feel, mind you, they do love things, they do love people, but their love is not directed towards God. It, it can't be because of their situation. And so from their broken minds to their broken hearts, it leads to broken bodies as well. Look what it says there. They're given to sensuality. Sense of this passage is that when a person becomes ignorant of the true meaning of things and the true value that God puts on them, this person will make his goal in life something other than God. Something other than God. And maybe the gratification of his body in sex or drink or drugs or food. Or maybe the gratification of his ego with a more refined intellect or cultural pursuits. Anything but God satisfies them and they use their body in all the wrong ways. In fact, Paul will go on to say that they are greedy to practice in purity Inevitably, this hardness and darkness and ignorance and licentiousness spill out into all kinds of uncleanlinesses. Look how in verse 19 ends, greedy to practice every kind, every kind of uncleanliness. Literally, their covetousness drives them to pursue practices that in God's eyes are impure. <sighs> This is not a good listing of characteristics, is it? But brothers and sisters, this was you and me before Christ. And what's interesting about this is that Paul is writing to believers, people that are in Christ. He's saying, listen, this is what you were. He's trying to tell living people what dead people are like. <laughs> I don't know about you, you've probably noticed this in culture, but there is a renaissance going on of sorts. Maybe renaissance is too refined of a word. But there is a renaissance going on in our culture today with zombies. Have you noticed this? They're on TV. They're on movies. They're in books. They are everywhere. And if you don't know what zombies are, you're... you're probably good not finding out, but to give you a short little lesson. In fact, you know, there's a school in Chicago, Columbia University, that has a course on zombies, everything you need to know. I'm sure many of you are going to rush out and sign up for that course, right? Zombies are the living dead. They died, but somehow they came back to life. And these zombies are so popular in culture today, right? You know what Paul is talking about here with these Gentiles, these individuals who are outside of God's will that don't have the gospel? They are living people to be sure, but inside, in their minds, in their hearts, in their actions, they are dead. They are the epitome of the walking dead. And here's Paul's argument. And you see this with every zombie TV show and movie. Do you ever realize those that aren't dead, the living people, they usually don't think very nicely about zombies. Do you ever notice that? It's not like the living people wake up one morning and say, you know what? I think I'm going to be a zombie today. How about you? Nobody aspires to be a zombie. Everyone tries to kill the zombies, right? Nobody says, I think that zombie life would be so fun and wonderful. How about you? Everybody runs away from the zombies. Paul's argument is similar. Hey, you were the walking dead. Why would you want to go back? It makes no sense. Be reminded, though, too, lest our hearts become too callous towards the walking dead amongst us, in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces. May I encourage you to remember they are the walking dead, but there's a Savior who loves to bring them back to life. That this is a characteristic of those who are outside of Christ. In fact, would you do me this favor this morning? If you have a piece of paper, if you have a, 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 a laptop or a, a, an iPad or a phone or something, something that you can just jot and note down, this is what I'd like you to write down. If you'd be willing to do this with me this morning, I would love for each one of you to write down the name of an unbeliever that you have in your life. 
could be someone in your family, could be someone you work with, somebody in your neighborhood, someone that you go to school with, I don't know. I'm just saying someone that you consider a friend, a colleague, someone that you love, that I would ask if you would be willing right now just to write their name down in your phone, on a piece of paper, because I want us to remember that the walking dead are all around us, but there is a glorious God who wants to save that person. This is where they're at. This is where we were at. Lest we think that we're better than them, lest we think that we're above them, maybe we need our hearts to be touched again to remember that we too were the walking dead, futile, darkened, ignorant, hard, callous, given to sensuality, impurity. But a God of resurrection came to us. My encouragement to you is to keep that name with you, perhaps even this week. Perhaps to keep that individuals on your mind and on your heart so that when you come home away from this conference, may you encourage the walking dead around you to know the life that is found in Christ. Because after Paul talks about this way in which you should not walk, he then comes into an encouragement of what they should do. Look what he says here in verse 20. But that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. He's trying to make an emphasis here. The the reality is that you have now come away. You once were a walking dead, but now you're in Christ, and you learn Christ this way. And this is not just something like getting saved or asking Jesus into our heart. We have these little phrases in our community, don't we? I understand that these are good phrases that can help communicate to people what it means, but the Bible uses phrases like this, you've learned Christ. And some of us look at that and think, oh, that sounds so boring, though. Nobody wants to learn anything. I want to experience. Don't get me wrong. Paul is talking about the same thing. Because when you learn Christ, you experience Christ. I have a colleague of mine at the college that I teach at. who He's a theology professor. And oftentimes people come up to him and say, listen, I don't want theology. I don't need doctrine. Just give me Jesus. <laughs> My colleague is very patient with him, and he asks them this question. He says, very, very, very well, can you please tell me about this Jesus? And then the person will respond, oh, Jesus, he's the son of God. To which he says, no, 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 don't give me any theology. Well, well, well Jesus, he's the second person of three. No, 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 I don't want any doctrine. You see, Jesus is truth. He's defined by truth. The question is, have we received that truth? Have we made it true to ourselves? The reality is, is that we need to learn something of him in order to become like him. In fact, this is how we've heard him. This is what he says in verse 21. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as truth is in Christ. A better translation for this is you've heard Christ. Meaning, you've had this experience. You've heard the gospel, and it's entered into your life, and you've accepted it. And this is odd, is it not? I say this sometimes to my students. We are an odd bunch of people, you realize, right? We have given our life up. We are willing to die for a man none of us have seen. I've never seen Jesus physically. I've never touched him. I've never hugged him. I've never had a conversation with him like I do with most of you. Yet I've given my entire existence to a man I've never seen. You know what we call that? Faith. We had an experience with him through faith. In fact, Jesus said to Thomas, remember that? When Thomas wanted to see his hands and his side, he said, you want to see this? Here it is. But blessed are they who have not seen. He's talking about you and I there. We've never seen him, but we have heard him. And to be sure, this voice is calling to us to walk for him. My wife and I did something that we should have done a long time ago when we made this travel. We were up visiting my family in Canada first, and then we drove down to the conference. And to help some of the drive go a little easier, we do have some, some iPads in the car, all right? But we decided to do something and get headphones for each one of the kids. 
It was the quietest drive I've ever had in my entire life. Why we didn't do this early, I don't know, but it was wonderful. But my kids are now learning how to adjust to these earphones. Do you ever see people like this when they first put on earphones? All they hear is this, right? And so when I'm talking to them, they can't hear me. So what do they think they have to do? Dad, I can't hear you. They have to yell out, right? To which I say, you don't have to yell. I can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Don't worry about it, right? They're learning how to put on these earphones. In fact, you can even get, not that we got them for our kids, those noise-canceling earphones. Have you seen those? Where you put these on when you're on an airplane or you're in a crowded room, and all the hush, all the roar of the room comes to a hush. And you put those earphones on. Paul is encouraging the believers here, put on your your Jesus headphones. Cancel out all the noise of your community, all the temptations that are around you, and hear his voice. This is how you know you're his. This is why he would say, my sheep hear my voice, And I know them. And they know me. You were taught in him the truth of who Jesus is. And so we are to hear him. Hear who he is. And so Paul then gives this encouragement. To put off, to be renewed, and to put on. Verses 22, 23, and 24. To put off the old self, verse 22, which belongs to the former manner of life. Remember we just talked about that former manner. Those Gentiles who were darkened in their mind, in their heart, and in their behavior. The reality is when the truth of the gospel came, you put off the old self. Paul will talk about this in a number of places in his writings. In Romans 8, the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life. The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for cannot submit to God's law. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul will talk about how anyone is in Christ is a new creation. Metamorphosis comes to them, totally different than before. In Colossians 3, he talks about how we are to not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. And Paul uses this interesting imagery, this idea of putting off, that if you are in Christ, you put off the old, you put on the new. But that idea of putting off and putting on is a bit of a garment-like analogy, right? He's trying to get across to them that your old way of living doesn't fit anymore. That's what you were when you were a Gentile, but you're not a Gentile anymore. You're saved in Christ. And why would you want that old constricting outfit? A number of years ago, I uh, remember going through my parents' closet and trying to find some things. I came across one of my old jackets. Now, it was like this one. This isn't the exact one, but I remember finding one. I thought, oh, that's a nice-looking jacket. Yeah, I could totally still rock that one, right? I'm totally, I'm going to wear that jacket. It's going to look great. I started putting it on and realized very quickly as I put it on, This jacket does not fit. This jacket, I'm sure back in the day looked wonderful, but the jacket shrunk. (laughs) Let's just go with that, okay? Let's not give any other explanations of what happened. I would like to think the jacket shrunk, but in reality, I grew. And it doesn't fit anymore. Imagine I went to my wife and I said, look here, I found this beautiful jacket. What do you think? She would be very clear in a loving way to say, you need to take that off. It doesn't fit anymore. Why would you keep on wearing that jacket? I could try and make arguments. I could say to her, but look at the color. It just looks so nice. And it's got these snappy buttons and everything like that. I think it looks wonderful. To which my wife would have to say to me, take it off. It doesn't fit. That's what Paul is trying to say to the Ephesians here. This is what Paul is trying to say to you and I. That once we finally come to the realization that that old way of life doesn't fit anymore, well then, brothers and sisters, you're to take it off. 
You're to remove that old way of living and thinking and be done with it. Saints in past years would talk about this concept, giving it the word mortification. It was a big fancy word that essentially meant to put to death. Paul says, take it off, but he also says, kill it. Because that's what happened on the cross. Your old self was nailed to the cross through the perfect, satisfying work of Jesus Christ. So why would you pick it back up? And this is what he says to them in the next verse. You need to be renewed about this truth. He encourages them to be renewed in the spirit of their minds. Paul will talk about this in other passages in Romans chapter 12, a well-known passage that we know. I appeal therefore to you brothers by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your spiritual worship. Do you see that there? Paul talks about the mind, he talks about the body, and he talks about our attitude of worship all together, that we need to renew our minds. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I have to recognize that doesn't fit. The way I do that is I let the gospel change the way I think. And when I do that, when I realize what I can do, look what he says in verse 24, and to put on the new self. And so I realize I need a better jacket. I realize there's a better way of looking in this community, right? Okay, this one does fit, all right. The reality is that old way of living, it doesn't work anymore. So why would you go back to this? I can now go back to my wife and say, now what do you think? And she will be happy to say, that fits. Don't get any more weight, all right? The reality is Paul is saying you've been given a new reality. Put on the new self is what he says in verse 24. Created after the likeness of God in true righteous and holiness. You've been given garbs from the king. Why would you want rags from the devil? The reality is you have a new identity. So now Paul can say with this new reality, like in Romans 7, I now delight in the law of God. My heart has changed in light of my new identity. He can say in 2 Corinthians, For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comprehension. He can take the, the bruisings on his body, but he does so joyfully because he has a new identity in Christ. Ephesians chapter 3, just a chapter earlier, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant to you to be strengthened with power through the spirit in the inner being. My heart can fly because of my identity in Christ. And look what he says there, to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God. The likeness of God. Of God. Some of you know this term. You've heard the idea that we are created in the image of God. The, the Latin phrase, the imago Dei, comes to mind here. And there's, excuse me, many ideas and concepts that go into this imago Dei. That God created man with certain abilities that reflect who God is. That we, we can think like God. We can emote like God. We're creative like God. But I think uniting many of those ideas is the fact that we have worth because we're made in God's image. We have worth from conception to death because that human being is created in the image of God. And because of this salvation that has now come back to us, we never lost it. In our, in our fallen estate. But now that Christ has given us a new identity, a new outfit, we are now being created even more like his image. Remember the story in Matthew chapter 22, where Jesus, again, trying to be trapped by the Pharisees and the religious rulers, they come to him asking him this question, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Oh man. Politics, taxes, religion, all wrapped up into one question. And they're trying to trick him. They're trying to trap him. And so you remember what Jesus asks, right? And it says, show me a coin. 
Someone produces a coin for him, which is incidentally interesting that the king of the universe doesn't have a coin in his own pocket. But nevertheless, a coin is produced. They, they, he holds up the coin and he asks that simple question, whose image is on this coin? To which they say, Caesar's. If you hold up one of your coins, one of your bills, Washington or, or Lincoln, or if you, you have one that has Franklin on it, I'd, I'd like to be your friend. But nevertheless, if you have those images, this is what Jesus was trying to show, right? To which he says, then render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's and unto God the things which are God. Interestingly enough, when Jesus asked that question, whose image is on this coin, it's the exact same phrase that is used all the way back in creation. That man was created in the image of God. And so this is Jesus' reasoning. Listen, if this coin has an image of Caesar on it, well then give it to Caesar. But who carries the image of God? That's you and I. And Jesus' encouragement then, render unto Caesar this thing which are Caesar's, and render unto God the things that are God's. This is so much more about who do you pay taxes to. This is an identity of that. You carry the seal of God. So therefore, render unto God the things which are God. That's actually the main part of that passage is that Jesus is trying to get beyond just who to ta- sell taxes or who to give your taxes to, but to the reality that we, we carry his image and now it is being renewed after his likeness. Paul is trying to convince him, put away the old. Why would you want to go back to that when you've been given something so much better? Don't walk like that. Recognize where you are at. During World War II, the USS Indianapolis, interestingly enough, as we're in the state, was torpedoed by a German attack. The entire boat went down. 1,200 men that were on this vessel, only 300 survived. The, 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 the reports of this later that were confirmed by numerous journals within the officers is that these men, many died in the explosion, but actually about five or 600 men survived and were in the boats. When questioned, how did it go from 600 to 300? They said the men, well, there were some sharks in the water and the heat got to the men. But he said one of the worst things that happened is that the men could not stop drinking the water. Do you see the irony of this situation? These men were in water and they were getting thirsty. But they were not in fresh water, they were in the ocean, they were in seawater. And sure enough, as their thirst increased and increased and increased, they would look out around them and they would think, oh, if I could just take a little bit of that water, to which many of the officers would have to scold them and say, no, if you drink that water, you'll actually be worse. But they couldn't help it. They saw all this water around them and they just wanted a little just to quench that thirst. And soon men started drinking it and becoming worse and some even dying after that. It looks so tempting though, doesn't it? I remember living like that. I remember some of the joy. Sin for a season is pleasurable. But in the end, it's death. We were meant to drink, but we're meant to drink fresh. We were meant to enjoy, but we're meant to enjoy in Christ. And this is what Paul keeps on trying to come back to time and time and time again. To be renewed, to then put on to, sorry, put off to be renewed and then to put on. This encouragement to walk away from the old way of living and to walk in the newness of the creation God has done in your life. So sure enough, look what he says in verse 25 then. He starts this list, therefore, putting away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, do not sin, do not let the sun go down on your anger, give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief steal no longer. Labor, honest work with us. And Paul starts going into this very interesting list of ways of living in the community. 
Ways in which we are to live in community life. As it were, a list of things to do and not to. Live like this and don't live like this. And we're going to go through this list. But as I was reading through this list, I realized, you know what? This is a great list of things to do and not do. But this list is not really exclusive to Christians. Don't steal. Don't sin in your anger. Give to those who need. Lay aside falsehood. Can I tell you, I have a lot of friends who are not Christians who agree with really all of this stuff. I know Muslims that are very honest people and would agree with this statement, don't lie. That There are Buddhists that I know that would look at this list and think, yeah, that's a great list of things to live by. I look at this list and I realize it's in relation to God, but my non-Christian friends look at this and still think, yeah, this is a pretty good list. The reality is all religions, even non-religions, advocate a certain morality to be lived out in community. Even the most ardent atheist would argue you shouldn't steal. So what makes this list different for us as Christians? What makes this list of do's and don'ts different for those of us that have been given a new identity in Christ? And therein, I think, is the answer. We already have an identity. And the encouragement is because of this new identity, live this way. For many of my non-Christian friends, whether they be Buddhist or Muslim or atheistic, they're still trying to find their identity in their works. Do you see the difference? Most of my non-Christian friends are trying to do the right things to become right. We as Christians are to do the right thing because we've been made right. Do you see the difference? This list could be applied to any religion, but the major difference is they're trying to earn their salvation. Our salvation's already been earned. So live it out accordingly. And he encourages them to not lie, to, as it were, to speak the truth. And we see this concept throughout Scripture time and time again. And the reality is we often lie, whether it's at work or on exams or with family and friends, we often conceal the truth or lie to really kind of present ourselves in a positive way, right? Or to avoid a consequence that may come if we tell the truth. My youngest daughter, Olivia, just a few months ago was coloring at the table, the kitchen table. And they have their special markers that they're supposed to use, but this one day she got mom's markers. Mom has a special collection of markers, and some of you know them, they're called Sharpie markers. And if you know what Sharpies are, they're not just markers, they're permanent markers. And my daughter, Olivia, four years old, was using this permanent marker coloring on her page that bled through onto the table. And I came in, I said, Olivia, no, you're not supposed to use it. I lift up the page and sure enough, you come to my house today, you'll see a large blue permanent ink stain on our kitchen table. If any of you have any ideas of how to get it out, please talk to me later. I pulled that page up and I looked at Olivia and said, oh, Olivia, who did this? And of course, I know who did it. I know exactly. She's literally holding the marker in hand, looks at me with those big eyes and says, I don't know. (laughs) Similar to what Adam and Eve dealt with, right? Adam, where are you? God knew exactly where he was. But he still felt he had to hide. He had to conceal because he was afraid of the consequences. Paul is saying, now that you've been given this new identity, it makes no sense to keep on lying. Instead, we are to speak truth. And he says this because you are now in community with others. Let each of you speak truth with his neighbor. Look what he says at the end of verse 25. For we are members one of another. We're in the body. So the body shouldn't lie to the body. You know what that means? The body should not lie to the body. What if my hands and my eyes start lying to each other? 
Last night when we got into our room, we were opening up one of the closets and we saw an ironing board and an iron in there. And I said, oh good, we can iron our clothes. Imagine all of a sudden, tomorrow morning I wake up and I want to iron a pair of my pants. My, my eyes start lying to my hands. And my eyes tell my hands, oh, that's not a hot iron. Go ahead and grab it. And I grab it and it's hot and it's scalding and it burns me and my hand would be upset. Eyes, why would you lie? The eyes would say, yeah, it doesn't bother me. I didn't get burned. No, 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 no. You're connected. The hand is now hurt because the eyes lied. The whole reality is the body is damaged. Paul is trying to communicate the same idea that even though you may lie and it may not hurt you, it does hurt someone else in the body of Christ. So speak the truth. There may be consequences. There may be repercussions. But you've been given a new identity. Don't walk like that anymore. He goes on in verse 26 to encourage this idea then to be angry and yet do not sin. This encouragement to be angry but to not sin in your anger. This is a very interesting one, especially for us Christians. I I would venture that Christians, I would say even beyond Christianity, have one of two responses to anger. Either one, our culture says, if you get angry, just let it out. No matter where, no matter what, if you are angry, explode. The other response of many, and I I would say many Christians, is if you're angry, keep it in. Don't let it out. Don't let others know you're angry. Good Christians don't get angry. To which when I hear that sometimes, I go back to this first, to the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit who says to the Ephesians then and to us now, be angry. There should be some things that anger you. But the encouragement of scripture is, is that you let that anger motivate you. Not to the point of sinning, as he will say later there, but to the point of action for God. Does it anger you when you see sin in your life? Does it anger you when since Roe v. Wade has happened in 1973, over 50 million babies have been murdered in this country? Does it anger you that there is still a slave trade happening in this world, even in the backyard of this very campus? Does it anger you to do something about it? It should. You should get angry, much like Jesus did in Mark chapter 5. Remember the story of the man with the shriveled hand? And Jesus asks the Pharisees who are watching, which is better, to to heal him or to not? And they, they don't want to answer. They don't want to get trapped up. And Jesus gets angry. Much like he did when he was at the temple, tossing up the tables and seeing the vileness within his father's house. There are times you should get angry. My encouragement is let it motivate you to good and not to let it fall into sin. That's what Paul says here in verse 27. Because if you let it go into sin, you give the devil an opportunity to work. You give Satan a stepping stone, as it were. And so his encouragement is to be angry, but don't give in to sin. In verse 28, he then goes on to say, to not steal, but to work hard to share. This is interesting because the way Paul writes this is in the present tense. He says to them, essentially, some of you are stealing. And he's trying to encourage them to stop. To stop stealing from each other. Rather, verse 28, with his own hands labor to do what is good in order that he may have something to share with him who has need. This idea, this reality to stop stealing and work hard to give much. See, interestingly enough, God doesn't want any Robin Hoods. Do you guys know who Robin Hood is? Stories out of England of this man with a bow and arrow. Many different stories that came in. But the main thought of Robin Hood is he steals from the rich to give to the poor. Paul is saying to all of us here, God does not need a Robin Hood. 
He doesn't want you to steal from anyone. He wants you to work hard, but he doesn't want you just to work hard so you have stuff. Brothers and sisters, it is not wrong to have stuff. The problem is when that stuff has us. When consumerism has driven us to want more and more. Paul's encouragement here is work hard, get stuff so you can give it away to those who really need it. And are we willing to showcase that in our new identity? That's, that's the way we used to live. We used to live of mine, mine, mine. Now that we have a new identity, Paul is saying give, give, give. Give till it hurts. And we're going to be presented even this week with opportunities to give to those who are laboring in God's field for his glory. Give till it hurts. Don't steal. Work hard. Give much. And Paul ends some of this passage off here. Verse 29, he goes on talking about corrupting talk, how that needs to be mitigated and put away, that we need to have words of grace, that we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit, to put away bitterness and anger and wrath, quarrel, eating, slanderous talk, to be kind and compassionate, this encouragement after encouragement. And Paul ends this passage to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, and he, he gives gives us encouragement just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. He's trying to make a transition now here. After saying all these things of how we should not be, Paul is now trying to make an encouragement of how we should be. Why? Because look what God has done for you. Why should you be loving? Why should you be tenderhearted? Why should you be forgiving? Because that's exactly what God did for you and me. God forgave us. How can we not forgive others? Many of you remember the story of the Stains, missionaries in India from Australia, a family of five, a mother and father, two sons and a daughter. One, tragically, the father and the two sons, two small boys, were burned alive in their car. Many of you know this, this made international headlines. The wife was widowed, the, the daughter no longer had brothers or a father to accompany them. They took some time off back in Australia, but they decided to come back to India to continue the work at the leper colony that their husband started. People were amazed. After the murders, people would ask, why can you do these things? How is it that you can do these things? Gladys Steins, the, the now widow, said, if we don't experience the grace of God, we become bitter. We have to turn to God, not others. We experience forgiveness so we can forgive others. Once you forgive, there will be healing. The reality of that dear sister was that she doesn't forgive out of her own heart. She forgives because of what's already been sown into her heart. She knows she's been forgiven. So how can she not help but want to forgive others? And many, many people have seen the testimony of this godly woman. As one associate said, she may be an ordinary woman, but I believe God has used her in India as an extraordinary tool to spread his gospel. Why should we be different? Look what he's done for us. He's gotten rid of our old identity. He's given us a new identity. We're to put off the old so we can live in the new. And my encouragement to you, brothers and sisters, is that we recognize the new outfits that have been given. That we not walk as we once did, but that we walk in the newness of the forgiveness of Christ. Father, we come to you this morning. And we thank you for the truth of your word. Your word is a light unto our feet. But Lord, we need to walk it. We need to, to take up your truth. And we need to be hurt by it and challenged by it and changed by it. And Lord, I pray that you would help us now. As we have heard these words, that we would recognize, are we wearing old clothing? Are we wearing an old way of thinking and living that is just not honoring to you? So I pray, Lord, that you would help us. Help us to put off the old. Help us not to walk like we used to walk. But help us, Lord, to walk for your glory 
In the name and in the power of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.